Hey guys, what's up? It's me again, Tom from TTT Tom's Tech Time. Welcome to a new episode. Today I want to show you how to set up the camera of your DJI Mavic Pro 2 because you can really get so much out of this DJI Hasselblad design camera that it is really a waste to not set up the camera correctly. Let's get this episode started. Don't forget to leave a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to never ever miss any of my upcoming episodes again. And don't forget to check out tomstechtime.com for the very best drone blog. And in general, there is tons of drone stuff on that website again, tomstechtime.com. But right now, let's get this episode started. Once the drone is connected and we found a nice and comfortable spot to sit and focus, we can get started and not waste a minute. When tapping at the symbol right below the orange shutter button, the camera menu pops up. Three submenus get visible. Luckily, we do not have to take care of all settings before each flight. Let's tap at the gear icon to bring up the first submenu. The histogram is first in line. Turn it on. A tiny box appears that you can freely move around the screen and reposition. Inside the box we see many little mountains. They show if a shot is lit correctly or not. If the mountains tend to show up on the left side of the histogram, it means that there are many underexposed, saying too dark areas. If the mountains tend to appear on the right side of the histogram, it means that the current shot is overexposed, saying too bright. This tool is really helpful, I always use it, as often our smartphone screens are not precise enough or they're just too small or the display brightness fooled us. There are a thousand reasons why you should use the histogram, just leave it turned on and keep an eye on it. Head LEDs auto turn off should be enabled as well. Once activated, the mode makes sure that the front arm LEDs of the drone automatically turn off while recording, because you really don't want the LEDs to ruin your beautiful shots, right? Lock gimbal when capture is rather interesting for photographers. Once enabled, the mode makes sure to hold the camera in place while taking a photograph, even if the drone is accidentally being rotated or moved a tiny bit. It is useful but not relevant for filmmaking. Let's move on. Enable AFC mode is next in line and it should be activated as well. AFC stands for Auto Focus Continuous and once enabled the drone will not change the focus while recording a video. Turn it on and the focus won't ever interrupt you. Once you turn on overexposed, pretty disturbing looking zebra lines cover some of the areas of the screen, but don't worry, these lines won't be recorded. They only show the areas that are overexposed, but personally, I think that the lines are too much and that they're in the way and I'm already using the histogram, so I deactivate the zebra lines. We can skip auto sync HD photo and video caption as they are both not relevant for filmmaking at all. The only setting though, the next one I'm not sure about, is named hyperlapse video frame. It is new and not very self-explaining. I filmed a test hyperlapse once activating the mode and once having it turned off and I couldn't spot a difference. If you know what this mode does, please leave it somewhere in the comments below because I'm really interested myself. Once we now tap at save original, a submenu pops up. We can set up whether the drone shall save all single photographs when taking a panorama or a hyperlapse or if we only need the lower quality preview on our smartphones. Of course we should save the original files and next to that we need to make sure that the drone is saving RAW, not JPEG files. I must warn you though, taking hundreds of RAW photographs in a row needs a lot of storage capacity plus that your microSD card needs to be quite fast. I tested the best cards and you find a guide and the results when clicking at the link in the description below the video. It is definitely worth a click. Next is the Gridline submenu. In here we can either activate or deactivate gridlines. I love working with gridlines. You can briefly check your horizon, you can check if the horizon is level, you can frame your shots better. I leave the standard gridlines turned on. Now we can pick center points. Center points basically mark the center of the frame and you can not only choose between various different shapes, but you can even switch the colors. But what sounds totally neat and totally sweet is kind of useless to me. I leave them turned off and I do not need any center points at all and instead leave the menu again. The anti-flicker submenu is essentially when filming indoors with tungsten lights or of course when you're filming outdoors at night time with all the fancy tungsten light sources like street lights or the lights of houses and when having the anti-flicker set up wrongly you can be sure that your shots are going to look poor in the end. A bad flicker ruins otherwise good looking shots. Therefore I set the anti-flicker to auto because I never had any problems with that mode. Drone and smartphone determine where they are and adjust the flicker accordingly. 
The file index mode submenu is next in line, asking whether we want the files always to be named the same, saying DJI 001, DJI 002, DJI 003, and then you copy the files to the computer, put the card back into the drone, and then it again names the same files, DJI 001, DJI 002, DJI 003, and so on. Or whether we want the number always to continue and not to be reset as soon as we empty the microSD card. I highly recommend setting your drone to continuous. If you instead pick reset, you can easily get in trouble. One example, you have a folder with DJI files on your computer. You now want to copy more files to the very same folder, but because the files have the same names, the computer asks whether you want to replace the files or not, and then one wrong click and all your old files disappear and are being overwritten. I know what I'm talking about, and I have made that experience, and that's why I always make sure to pick continuous and stay safe. Peaking threshold is a nice function. Once you activate it, red lines cover all edges that are sharp and in focus. I actually like this tool for filming details or when filming on the ground with normal DSLR cameras. But when having a drone up in the sky and filming landscapes, you're usually quite far away. You focus once and then what you want to be sharp and in focus usually is sharp and in focus. And then I just think that the red lines are, I don't know, somehow blocking my view and therefore I leave the peaking function turned off. Next, you're being asked to pick a storage location. Do you either want to record to the internal storage or to a micro SD card? Well, I'd say that is up to you. I personally only use the internal storage as a backup in case, I don't know, I forget my memory card or in case that my micro SD card is full, then I use the eight gigabytes of internal storage. If you want to follow my lead, then I would say go with always using a micro SD card, write your files to a micro SD card, and then you have a little backup even if you run out of storage, for example. Let's head back. Finally, you can format your microSD card and your internal storage, or you can reset all camera settings. Woohoo! We've made our way through the first submenu, and the good news is that you usually do not have to ever take care of that submenu again. Of course, if you want to switch the storage location, or if you, I don't know, want to maybe turn off the grid lines, then feel free to open up the menu again. But usually, you really can now forget about this menu, and we can now take a look at the second submenu. Once we are looking at our smartphone again, we can switch to the next menu. First, we want to open up the resolution and frame rate submenu. In here, I highly recommend you to pick 4K, the highest resolution. It is not only future proof, but it has a better performance even on non 4K displays. But you can pick between two, HQ, high quality, and FOV, field of view. The difference briefly covered and without a technical explanation is that in HQ mode, you get the best quality possible and a narrower field of view, while in FOV mode, you get less quality but a wider view. I clearly recommend using the HQ mode. Both the higher quality and the narrower perspective make your videos look more professional by far, even though filming is a tiny bit tougher with the narrower field of view. Next, pick 24 frames per second as your frame rate. That is the standard frame rate for film productions. I, back in the days though, started using 25 frames per second for whatever reason, and I will now stick with that. On the next Mavic, I hope to see 4K at 60 frames or more per second. That would be super cool and not only for creating slow motion videos, but for a game-alike fluid film experience. Let's head back and click at video format to bring up the next submenu. In here, you can either select MP4 or MOV. Nowadays, it doesn't make a difference anymore. But as a Mac user, I'm going to pick MOV. I remember that back in the days, my Microsoft computer often struggled with MOV files and worked more stable with MP4 files instead. But finally, it all comes down to the question of whether you're using an up-to-date editing computer because they should be capable of playing back both or a model from, I don't know, the early 70s or 80s. The white balance submenu is a critical one and you should check it before each flight. What happens if the white balance is set up wrong? The final footage has a color tone to it. Sometimes it looks a bit reddish, sometimes slightly bluish. What might be okay and fixable with only one recording can really be a disaster if each of your shots has a different color tone. That's why you should never ever pick auto. And it is so simple. Just adjust the white balance to your surrounding. In my case, I can now either pick sunny or cloudy at the moment. They would both kind of fit. Make sure to check this menu once before each flight and you'll never ever have any trouble with weirdly tinted material. Next on the list is the style submenu. Once we tap at it, we can apply some essential changes. If you want the overall sharpest results, you should pick manual and apply plus one to the sharpness minus two to the contrast, and minus two to the saturation. In my eyes, these settings guarantee the sharpest and most accurate settings. 
Next in line would be the color submenu, but before we can apply changes here, we need to focus on the very last menu, the camera video coding menu. We can either pick H.264, which is my clear recommendation if you are working on a rather old computer, or H.265 if you're working on a modern computer and if you really want to color grade your footage later. Because only when having H.265 enabled, we can use the 10-bit color depth of the drone. Let's now go back and open up the color submenu. The DJI Mavic 2 Pro offers quite some interesting options. If you don't like color grading at all, then go with normal. The footage looks nice right away. HLG we can skip, I would really not know who should use it and D-Log M is the perfect color profile for all those who want to capture as many details as possible. It lets you not only record many more details in the shadows and highlights, but it enables 10-bit. And that's one of the main reasons why people bought the Mavic Pro 2. Just as a reminder, standard 8-bit cameras and settings record approximately 16 million possible color tones. 10-bit cameras and settings though let you record about a billion different color tones. 10-bit is your go-to choice if you want the very best results and if you know or want to learn how to color grade your recordings. Let's right now take a look at the very last leftover submenu and don't worry, I know it is the one that you have to even check during a flight, not only before each flight, but really when you, for example, rotate your camera and the camera faces towards the sun, then you really have to change the settings. And then when you turn away from the sun, you have to change the settings. And maybe when you tilt the camera down, the settings are differently than if, for example, the camera is just looking up. So it all sounds a bit scary, but it is very doable if you once understand how to set things up. And I will right now show you what to dial in for the very best and the most cinematic settings and results. Let's get this started. Let's take a look at the very last uh, submenu. The last menu is the only one that you need to check regularly. You can either, as right now, let the camera do the job when picking the auto mode. Or you can select the aperture priority where you can determine the aperture only and the camera takes over all other settings. Or you can pick the shutter priority mode where you choose the shutter speed and the camera does the rest. Or you really learn filmmaking or use your knowledge and get the most out of your camera and pick manual. Manual is the only option in which the settings cannot change during a shot. I had that quite often when I for example tilted the camera from a brighter sky to a darker ground it was really visible how the camera adjusted some of the settings and that really ruins the professional look of my shots. Therefore I decided to always stick and stay with manual and never ever worry about these very visible mistakes inside my footage. The ISO goes first. The ISO is basically a tool to digitally brighten up footage. The lower you keep the value, the better the quality and the look of your footage. I recommend to keep the ISO on 100 during daytime and at night you can, I don't know, maybe pick a maximum of 800, otherwise your footage really starts looking too grainy. A manual aperture is a cool tool and luckily we are drone flyers and can be a bit more flexible using the aperture than maybe, I don't know, a portrait photographer on the ground. While he might want to pick the widest aperture for the strongest bokeh, saying the most blurred background, we can choose the aperture that marks the sweet spot. And with the DJI Mavic Pro 2 that would be f5.6. I took the footage to the test and compared so many shots and I really think that f5.6 delivers the best results. What is left? The shutter speed. Now the shutter speed really needs to do the rest. Let's look at what looks good. Maybe that looks proper? But let me tell you something, a high shutter speed does not give a healthy and good looking amount of motion blur. There is a simple rule, the shutter speed needs to be twice the frame rate. As we chose 24 as our frame rate, that would make a shutter speed of 48, but that value just does not exist at all. Don't worry, you just select the closest value available. That would be 50. In my case with 25 frames per second, that is even perfect. And, well, what happened now? Why is everything so really, really bright? Can we somehow fix that? Or do we now have the perfect settings and, you know, I don't know, everything is totally overexposed? Don't worry, of course there is a solution and the solution is named ND filter. What is an ND filter? An ND filter, a neutral density filter, is basically nothing else but a tiny sunglass for your camera's lens. You screw it onto the camera and less light is being able to enter the camera and hit the sensor. That basically means you can have the perfect shutter speed even if it is super bright outdoors and still the image won't look way too bright. And that is pretty awesome, but there are different strengths of filters. 
for different situations. If you want to check out my guide on that, then feel free to check out tomstechtime.com slash nd. A link can be found in the description below the video as well. You can check it out and in the description below the video, I posted links pointing at the very best ND filters for the DJI Mavic Pro 2. Because if you buy cheap ones, then often they have a weird color tone to them because the job of the ND filter is to really only darken an image, not apply any changes to the color. And that's why I recommend only using exactly these filters that I'm holding here. They're really the best ones. They're doing the job awesomely. And right now there's nothing left to say, but don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to leave a thumbs up and don't forget to maybe check out Tom's Tech Time. The blog is fascinating. Finally, it is up. I was really struggling with that in the beginning. You know, I, I posted a new blog article maybe once a month. And uh, right now it is finally a life. Check it out, tomstechtime.com. Best blog, drone deals, accessories for drones and so much more stuff. And if you're still watching me talking, then maybe click at one of the videos here to my side. Maybe these videos will be truly enlightening. Sayonara, au revoir, thanks for watching.